see if you do that at the end. That's the big question. Right? <laughs> You're still going to do it. So I have a few slides to share. Uh, I'm not a fan of a lot of slides, so there's not a ton. But we will talk fair about now. I think we have an hour, maybe three hours. <laughs> we have some talks. So I'll do my best to scan across the whole room, but I tend to get fixated on things. So please point you, you point me, you're like, hey, look that way once in a while, and I'll, I'll make sure I do so. See if this works. It does. So it's always smart to put an agenda up there, right? So you have some expectations as the audience on what's going on. These are some of the things I'm going to cover in small and large amounts. So I know part of this talk was about the role of cyber intelligence in cybersecurity. I'll explain what that means a little bit. I'll ask you questions to get your understanding and then hopefully clarify things together. Because not everybody understands what we mean by the word cyber and intelligence together. Sometimes we would say threat intelligence, but threat intelligence and cyber intelligence aren't synonymous. And we'll talk about why. And then of course, how it relates to election security and you can kind of read the rest, case studies, attacks and vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities and activities, I'm sorry. Uh, attackers and motivations, vulnerabilities and activities. Those two will probably get munched together, but we'll, we'll work on it. You'll have questions, I'm sure. Uh, before I go past this, this goes back to my military background, which I'll talk about in a second, but every time you're in a room, you should always know where the exit is. So I did a lot of teaching overseas, a lot of teaching in sometimes weird zones where anything could happen, and you needed to know how to get out of a building. So everybody should know where their exit is, which is Right there, or over there. So keep that in mind in case something does happen. Hopefully, it doesn't, but you never know. Do anybody that is medically trained, EMT, basic, that first, kind of aid. basic first aid, cool. All right. The reason I bring it up is I, I do have MS. I've never had a seizure while I'm teaching, but it could happen. <laughs> and if it does, I just want you to know: make sure I don't hit my head on the floor. I would appreciate that. And after that, all you have to do is call 911. You don't need to do anything else. Keep it simple. And Carrie is like, she knows what to do. She's had me go through this a couple of times. So it is all good. All right. I got all that out of the way. Let's talk about who I am. So I've sat where you sat, and I've wondered why is this person up here talking? Why should I care? Why should I listen? Why should I be interested? Well, hopefully you're here because of the material, not so much me. But I will talk about me in just a little bit. Sit wherever you want. So as it says, I've done this for 29 years. I count a lot of times that I was in uniform. So I spent 23 years in the service, 10 years in the Navy, 13 years in the Air Force. So part of the reason that that time is important is that I, I, during my Navy time, I did POW and my work, which means I did a lot of cold case research on events that happened 30 years ago, now 40, 45 years ago. So starting from 1961 forward, I did a lot of research on the Vietnam conflict. And we went in-country, Southeast Asia, so Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, some parts of Australia, and Lower China to look for missing both military, federal, and civilians that were lost. And we did both sides, our side and the Vietnamese side as well. Now that came very important because in that I learned to be a profiler as well as a researcher and apply that information Come on in. Walk right in front, it's awesome. <laughs> we don't want it. to apply to what later became cybersecurity. Because finding things that are hidden, finding things that are in nooks and crannies, understand how things connect, understanding people and how they relate to technology and to actions become very important. Those are foundational issues for any kind of intelligence work, whether it's cyber or something else. And so it became important. There's a list of other things I did during that time frame from engineering and so forth. So really the focus was on security. When I moved to the Air Force, I went to work for the Office of Special Investigation. Anybody familiar with AF OSI? Okay. Not like anything you see on TV. It's much more boring than that. <laughs> but working with that law enforcement agency for the Air Force, I did seven plus years of cyber crime for Department of Defense and Department of State. The rest of that time was spent doing intelligence work. Now, the cold case work I started, for law enforcement, I've maintained throughout the whole 29 years. And I take great satisfaction when I see those good results. And some of them do, usually one to two a year, which is good, especially if you have anybody you know that's in that category, which I hope not. All right, the other parts here you can just kind of read. 
two decades, law enforcement support, and so on. The reason I tell you this is why I'm standing here and think that I have even a little bit to share is because out of that background experience are some nuggets I think you could use as you're moving into that kind of career, or if you're looking at that kind of career, or you're doing something tangent to that career, where having information from there would be interesting, would be useful. And this part here, the bottom paragraph, is probably another important part. So it's one thing to be a technical hand, to be someone who's very adept and very skilled at working in that arena. But you also want to know that that person can organize, can build teams, can put together folks, can hire, can organize, can set up a structure, build an intelligence program. That's what we did and what I've done for the last decade for other companies. Very important. So it gives me background on which to speak to you from. Now, this is our cyber defenses overview. So I do work for cyber defenses. Uh, I've been an employee for the last three years. Uh, it's the first time I've been an employee since I had left, because before this I ran several companies. Uh, ATX Forensics was the company I merged into cyber defenses. And they did forensics and intelligence work as well as training here in Austin, hence our name. Anybody want to guess what ATX stands for? <laughs> right? I didn't say we were Austin, but it was recognizable, which was kind of important. We took two things, Austin, Texas, and forensics and counted them together, which made sense because we were a forensics company. And so cyber defenses has been around for 20 plus years, since um, 2001. 2001. Right after 9-11. Right after 9-11, mm -hmm. yes. Randall Casey, our founder, actually responded to that particular event and it kind of set the stage for what cyber defenses would become. And we mostly catered to a federal market for years. In the last couple of years, we've kind of moved more into the public sector and have, have almost completely, actually we have completely transitioned away from federal over the last three years and moved completely into a commercial sector where we're bringing the same things that we brought to the government and to both public and special programs to kind of corporate and public. So the same work we did for them, building security operation centers, training personnel, putting people on the ground where they needed them both here or elsewhere. You know, we do that for public sector and, and companies as well. That looks kind of different. Obviously we don't just hire a bunch of people and send them to a federal agency. We have an apprenticeship program where we train people to go uh, from an academic level of understanding to very practical hands-on application to be a security analyst. And we do that over a year. It's kind of a very challenging program. It's nine months of boot camps and um, really mean application because we put you right in front of our customers to teach you what to do. Mm -hmm. And so we, we don't try to instill more information, we just try to make you understand what you already know and get you to leverage it and add things in where you have gaps. That's kind of cyber defenses. Outside of that, we do forensics, intelligence, election security, cyber security of any kind, incident response. Is anybody unfamiliar with those terms? It's okay to say, I don't know. How about you, sir? Incident response? What does that mean? Either one of you. It's fine. Take your time. Uh, I was going to say, when, when the things go very awry and, and, and our electricity is out for the city and we don't know, we don't know why, that's, I guess that's what it could be a type of incident response. Yeah. Typically, we mean it more in a computer or IT solution kind of problem. In that case, maybe someone's attacked the entity, the, the company that actually supplies your electricity. We would respond to that company to try to figure out what happened. It could be that someone attacked their computers, gained entrance, and then shut them down. That could have been done via ransomware, or could have been done via a malicious attack. It could have been staged. We kind of come in, fix the problem immediately, get them back to running, and then we answer why it happened. That's part of the incident response piece. Intelligence plays the part in figuring out why. Our incident responders, they fix it, they mitigate the problem. They get in, they control, they mitigate, they set it up, they get you back to working, and then the intelligence team would come in and go, okay, here's why that happened, and also how. Okay. We're possible, it's not always possible, but most of the time. So cyber defenses kind of does a broad spectrum of things. I'm gonna go into more on its election piece, so I'm not gonna dwell on it here. And Carrie, keep me up. Raise your time. We can all talk a lot. See, I got ahead of my slides. <laughs> so these are our three three agencies, three areas, excuse me, of, of, of cyber defenses. You'll see that cyber advisory or guidance is number one. In fact, every engagement, every contract we write, we add roughly two things. The first is guidance. 
A lot of times people come to us with an understanding of a problem. They're trying to frame it to us so that we can help them, but frequently they're wrong. And so we do a short engagement to give them guidance to help them understand what they're really asking for. Because sometimes they'll ask for something super expensive that they don't need. And so we'll talk them out of it. My boss hates it when I do that, but it's the right answer. And so from that comes an appreciation that they re-engage with us to get the right things they need. And it always turns into more business. So it's always a service part. We always add advisors. The other part of that is operations. This is the part that, as you can read here, we go in, we fix things. That's the incident response. We also run a full-time security operations center. What is a security operations center? You've got cool crypto on your shirt, man. you got to know. <clears throat> Essentially, where you can see threats coming in, um, monitoring your assets. Sure. Absolutely. That's where a company, usually decently sized, will define a department whose sole job is to take in all the security alerts from all the computers and devices they have and take them through and their security appliances, witness devices, all those things that they put in their network to defend it or to make detections and send it all to one place. And they'll put uh, security operations center analysts in there to read that information and understand what's going on. And with there are some engineers and a couple other things. The composition changes a little bit. But you've got the heart of it. They're reading all the security information. Now here's the tough question. Why would they do that? This is anybody. You can answer if you want. Why would we do, why would I have a third party do that? No, why would we have a security operations center in a company? In a company? Sure. So I can appropriately analyze third party access. So I can appropriately appoint my That's analysts, assets, assets people. people. Okay. It becomes your center point, kind of like a brand for your security and defensive structure for your company. If you're a startup, a lot of times you'll throw a network together, you'll throw computers together, you have a very loose setup, you haven't thought about security yet. The downside to that approach is whatever security you begin with, you keep for a couple years. So if you start with no security but have great ideas, awesome ideas that are very valuable but you don't protect them, you tend to lose them very quickly. Now, the downside to that kind of market, criminals will steal that information but not actually utilize it for three years, four years. They'll let you build that intellectual property up and then they'll execute and sell it to That's why they can terrorize, if you will, startups. So a SOC, or Security Operations Center, allows you to kind of have a central area to gather information about your network and about the security you put in place so that you can take actions to stop things like that, prevent things from, like phishing, which I gather everybody's had at least one phishing email in their life, right? You have not had a phishing email? Come on, somebody's not had a phishing email. Does anybody not use email? It's so much a part of us, right? So <laughs> there's a whole industry around phishing, both on my side, or your side, if you will, on the security side, the blue hat side, right? Or, you know, keep it simple, blue hat side. And then there's the, the, the other side, the more malicious side, where they want to get information out of you, and using email as a communication method is very efficient because we all use it, and we're all susceptible to clicking on that issue, right? They're, they've got them very sly. Right. I could talk about that too much. I'm going to stop there. The other part of this is cyber intelligence. What? Oh, there we go. See, this is why you should be up here. This is the role of cyber intelligence in cybersecurity. We do a lot, and I will say the way we perform cyber intelligence at cyber defenses, I know there's two cybers there, uh, is a little different than where you may see in other agencies. So threat intelligence, not you, sir, because I've already asked you, but somebody else. What is threat intelligence? Has anybody heard of threat intelligence? You've heard of threat intelligence. That's awesome. OK, I've got one. Maybe two, three, okay, good. What is threat intelligence? Um, so the way I understand it, you're, um, you understand which groups are operating in the space and um, kind of what they're, what tools they typically use, what are the threat indicators that you would potentially see if you saw a system be compromised um, so that you can detect those for all of your systems. Okay, good. So you understand threats and the, and the entities they represent and what they're, TTPs are, and they sort of that word. It's kind of a military term that's been stolen by the public sector to mean a little bit more than it's supposed to, but so tactics, techniques, and procedures. The way they do business would be a simpler way to express it. How they do business, in the order of things that they do business. 
is what is represented by that. And you create threat profiles of groups. And if, they're, if you're familiar with CrowdStrike, they give them funny names. Something something panda, something something hyena. And all those represent, it's a great marketing, by the way, because they have awesome imagery to go with each one of those. But outside of that, their content's a little suffer, they suffer a little bit. But they create a lot of information about different threats. What they be, what they mean, how they could attack you. That's more standard threat intelligence. Now there's two parts to that as well. Another part is they generate a lot of indicators about that activity. And a lot of times those get fed into security devices. That's classic threat intelligence. I know about a threat, I know all the characteristics. Um, anybody have a background in criminalistics or anything like that? All right, I'm not gonna get into that. There's a separation in characteristics. They're both specific and accidental characteristics. Uh, accidental characteristics are tool marks. They're what you leave as an individual employee, whatever that is. And that's very important because it shows personalization. So when you do a threat profile, you want to, if all of us are using Mimikatz, you may know what Mimikatz is? You know what Mimikatz is? Credential stealing, hack tool. Uh, everybody uses it a little different. And it's very modifiable, so if I modify it in a small way for me, as, my, as a threat group, I now have created a characteristic that is specific to me. And that would be an accidental characteristic. We don't need to get into the semantics, but it's important. So when that's the classic threat intelligence. What we add into that is cyber defenses, the intelligence team, all of us are investigators. We're all private investigators. We all came out of investigations from the Department of Defense or the Department of State. And we carried that with us, which gives us a lot more techniques than are normally in the arsenal for a, an intelligence team. That's why we call ourselves an intelligence team versus a uh, threat research department, which would be different. That would focus more on standard threat pro profile. So the reason that that makes us different is not only the investigative techniques, but we're a direct engagement company. Anybody want to guess what we mean by direct engagement? Not me too, because I already told you to. What is direct engagement? Now you, sir, by the window, <laughs> not with the camera. My guess is what, head on? Like, you, head on. You, you head on do it. It's not like you have, this is your threat, now go get it the way you want to go get it. You guys go after it immediately? Or? We go after it directly. Okay. So for most threat research entities, they will take other people's reports and other people's reporting and create a digest that they'll make a threat profile out of. You know, CrowdStrike will publish a report. You know, if I, when I worked at Fidelis Cybersecurity, we would go and gather that information, attach it to and add in there, enrich it with information that we knew of specifically and create a threat profile. We were not direct engagement. Cyber defense is when we have a question, a company comes to us with a problem, or we're doing an investigation on them, we go to the criminals that are probably attacking them, and we directly engage them to find out information. So you're almost playing detective as well, instead exactly. of just investigating. Correct. And we do it under a law enforcement shield, and we share that information appropriately. So we, but it allows us to gather things that you can't gather from reading other people's reports or just looking at open reporting or even closed reporting. Open reporting, anybody can see. Closed reporting, it's privately held. Question? Yes, please. So would you say that's uh, that's hacking back? So you've got like, hacking into the. So it's social engineering back, if you will. It's <laughs> all it's all completely social engineering on our side. As the criminal, you don't know that I'm not another. I'm, so, I'm either in that role, let me get your question, sorry, in that role where I'm playing a neutral party. <clears throat> I'm soliciting information from you in a way that's acceptable to whatever community we're interacting on. Wait. So how, I mean, is that technically any more, any, or substantively any different than essentially, you know, doing essentially undercover work, just in a cyber capacity? It is identical in many ways. Where we're playing, a role. We have profiles, some of which are quite old. I think our oldest profile is just under 20 years old. It's been around for a while. And it came into being a long time ago. <laughs> so, um, what that allows us to do is gather information that you can't glean from just doing straight up research. And that, that kind of makes us a differentiator in what we can find. So a lot of what we see is more early warning activity. So we see the planning stage of an attack. It's not always defined to you. It might be an attack general against, say, UT. We would see the discussion, but they probably wouldn't call it up by name. They would use a nickname or an operational name, 
And it's our job to figure out what those mean and find out what they are so that we can find further information. And we kind of keep our finger on that pulse in a lot of communities. Because they're people. They have to talk to each other to do business. Yes? If you see an operation being planned against somebody who's not a client, what do you do with that information? If we can divulge that information without compromising that profile or putting things at risk, we'll tell them. And we've done that, I, I do that almost every month. If I can figure out who they're talking about. Now I will tell you, a lot of times it goes nowhere because they don't have a way to receive that data. Hmm. And you have to do it carefully because if I tell you, hey, you're about to be attacked and you get attacked, guess who gets pointed at? Us. <laughs> so it becomes very difficult, which is why we try to work under law enforcement shield because they become the communication chain to the individual and it's more accepted. But companies that have a bug bounty, bug bounty program or have an open uh, communication channel to report information, we have great success with that. Usually all the big companies um, have that kind of channel open. And we can report to them. Any other questions? Okay. So we dwell in a lot of places. Where do you think, so first off, what do you think a criminal looks like in this realm, in a, in a cyber realm? What does a cyber criminal look like? Look left and look right. <laughs> they look just like us. For many of them, this is a job. This is what they do to make money. This is what they do for a living. They don't care. Or they do care, but they, they have justified the action. And many of them dwell here. Many of them dwell overseas. It just varies. And so they have various communities they go to. Anybody on social media? You talk on social media, right? Something sometimes about irreverent things, sometimes about things that are close to you, sometimes about generality or food or what you're doing today. But every time you do, you give up a little bit of information. So about half my team is profilers. And what we do is we profile. We're classical profilers that were trained by the FBI or we're a similar federal agency. And we craft a remote profile. I've never met you, so I can't read your body characteristics, but I can read your activities. And that helps us find the individuals behind the threat layers. <coughs> it also gives us better fidelity on what those mean. So if you've read these kind of reports, frequently they'll come out and they'll say, okay, it's a group of people that are located in some location, Ukraine, Russia, China. China used to be the hallmark call for a long time. Now it's Russia. It's kind of whatever's popular. Reality is not so clean. And so where we come in is we might find someone who is Ukrainian, who happens to be living in the US, that is actually performing cyber activity in a forum that happens to live in Ukraine again. So saying that you're Ukrainian when they have no affiliation is, is wrong. They're actually a nationalized American citizen. They're just performing that kind of activity. Is that too general? Or do you want something more specific? Anybody care that? Somebody asked me where that stuff is. Where are those communities at? Somebody. The dark web. <laughs> Some of them, yes. So what do you mean by the dark web? I asked you this question earlier. Really. When you say the dark web, what are you referring to? What they reference all the time on the news to scare us. <laughs> <laughs> Tor, right? Yeah. The onion router. Okay, so what's, you have to define a dark net. Because there's many dark nets. Okay. So to define dark net, you have to know what clear net is. So what's clear net? This is thing, clear net's what everybody can get to. If you can pop open an index search engine, Google, DuckDuckGo, Bing, Yahoo, whatever, you can get to anything on the clear net. Anything accessible from an index search engine. Now, if you're a little more enterprising, you go to Wolfram Abram or one of the other style search engine or Carrot. So if you're ever looking for resumes, by the way, go to Carrot. Carrot allows you to find resumes in bulk. Useful if you're writing one. How many search engines can you name? Here's a great question. All right, so I've rattled off what? We got Bing, Google, yeah. Yahoo, DuckDuckGo, Shodan is a different kind of engine. Let's skip that one for a moment, just general search engine. Firefox. Shodan, what is it? Firefox. That's a browser. Safari. That's a browser. That's a browser, okay, sorry guys. Anybody else? Baidu, it's China's. Baidu, yeah, absolutely. That's not a China's Google. Yeah. Right? That, that's usually the nickname. Okay, there's a lot of them. So if you get stuck kind of looking at the ones you're always looking at, you should change them up. First off, as an intelligence person, this is a side note, when you're doing research, you always want to search in the, the general accepted search tool for the country you're looking at. 
So for us, the ones that I'd rattle off first are definitely for the U.S. primarily. Baidu would be rather, would be good. You can, there's also Google China, which is not as efficient for what you're looking for, and others. Now, you mentioned Shodan. Shodan's a specific kind of search engine for what? Uh, internet accessible devices. IoT devices. Yes. Kudo points if you can name the game where Shodan came from. Come on. No, go back. Not that old. It's not a Capcom game. But anybody know where the word? Anybody familiar with Shodan besides the gentleman here? No. no? All right. Anybody play games? Old computer games? Yeah. You won. Okay. <laughs> Did you ever play System Shock? No. So Shodan was the AI in System Shock that took over the uh, space facility, and so it was a not benevolent AI that was that was really good at bringing up information. So I generally used it to create Shodan. Now there's roughly a number of Shodan equivalents as well. Um, public www, binary search engine, where you search by binary code. You're looking at the code behind the page, not what's on the page. If you're interested, we publish a list of useful tools. <laughs> So if, let me answer the one question, and I'll move off the slider. I'll stay here forever. The reason I brought up dark nets is there, clear net is anything you get to from an index search engine, basically. Deep net is the next layer. So if you picture a, try to my ice floats on the water. Oh, iceberg. Iceberg. <laughs> if you picture an iceberg, the top layer is your clear net. The depth that is below, except for the very tip, is your deep net. DeepNet is something that you can derive from a source. So if you get to a source that has a, a server full of data that you can only get to by going to that site and constantly refreshing and getting page after page after new page, like you would if you do your taxes, anybody own a house, pay uh, county taxes, go to county taxes website, what do you gotta do, look at your address? That list of data behind that web page is the DeepNet. It's all the data that's deep in there that you can still kind of get to, but you can't portal to it. You can't go from a search engine straight to it. Now, the very tip underneath all that is your dark pants. And there are many. Tor happens to be one of them. They all require a specialized portal to walk into. Tor requires you to use the Tor router, which is a software router. What's a router do? Go back to basics real quick. Gentleman with the hat. You said a router? Router. Um, so you used to connect to the internet? That's correct. What else does it do, though? By definition, think of its name. Connecting to other, like um, lifeline. Lifeline. Um, the, the pole. I, I don't even know. That. No, it's cool. It's cool. A router, by definition, routes. Mm -hmm. That's what I was trying to get you. It routes information. So it is your portal to the internet, which is your network at home connecting, or your computer connecting to another network. The router is the bridge in between, and it routes traffic. It's smart enough to know how to route to different devices. That's what differentiates, differentiates it, I can't say that word for some reason, from a hub or a switch, right? Hubs, dumb. Switch is a little smarter. Router's the best in, in the sense of routing. We can talk about why and so forth, but just know there's multiple devices there. Routers are the typical one. A software router is one that is, has no hardware, but it does the same function. So for Tor, the Onion router, which was made by, you should know this one, who built Tor? Anybody? The US Navy? The US Navy, yeah. Okay. yeah. During the Cold War, they were trying to find a way to have um, systems stay connected. And so they worked on it for quite some time before they came up with this idea that they could create a decentralized system. And as the internet was kind of birthed, they realized that they could keep it together. As long as one system is alive inside the Tor network, it can survive and maintain connection. We would connect to it and get some data. It's kind of an interesting concept that has gone different ways. So dark nets, there are many. Brave net, free net, uh, all the coin nets, all those are dark nets. They all require some kind of specialized routing or a specialized piece of software to get in. And you cannot search for them. But when you get into those systems, there's no simple searching method. It's like going back to the old 90s internet. You have to know where you're going. If you've never heard of more dark nets, you should look them up, they're interesting. And they have a variety of information on them. People use them to be anonymous and to share data, usually in situations where you can't know them. 
that was kind of a primary use or thought behind Tor as well, was that you'd have an anonymity of who you were and you could share information or communicate in a way, perhaps in a country that doesn't ordinarily allow free speech. And there's many, many dark nets that have come up because of that and the desire for people to be independent and have freedom of speech without oversight. And there are all the goods and bads that come from that. All right, let me move on to this. Just know that we, we dwell in those areas because those are where the communities that criminals uh, go to to conduct business and just to be people. That's where they live. They also live on Facebook and other social media. Right, right now we're watching a campaign on Tumblr where they're talking back and forth, planning in the open, and they're doing it disguised. All I can say is appliances are interesting. And you wouldn't think that that would be a medium, but it can be. Just like we fought the gaming forum last year. Wouldn't think about it. So uh, let's talk about what's possible with Cyber Intel. This is one of our um, products. This is one of the things that we're working on right now. It's taking up a lot of our time. It's one thing I mentioned earlier. Uh, so all the classic stuff with threat, all the things we do investigative. This is another outreach of it where uh, we go where cyber criminals are. We understand how they do business. And we realize that there's a problem openly across the US and all over the world actually where individuals will set devices on gas pumps to steal credit card data and other information. And it can be it can take many shapes. It could be outside or inside the device. It could be adjacent to the device. It could be in the parking lot. It could be inside the building. And there's a variety of device types. What we said is, that's cool, but we really don't care about the device. We care about the people performing the action. And so we started watching the criminals. And we found out where they go, where they trade, where they talk, where they discuss, where they innovate on how to get around law enforcement intervention and people finding it, how to prevent accidental discovery and all that. And we capitalized on that to um, understand where they were selling things, how they put it together, how they were receiving and accepting data. And then we started identifying their channels, broke out what that data looked like so we could say, okay, that's a website, this is a pump, this is this kind of device, this is that kind of device. And then we started tracking it down to the location. So right now I think our error rate, with our, we're hitting about 50% on being right where we can trace it all the way down to the physical location that's being, where data's being sold. And we do that a lot of through crowdsourcing. There's a website called Wiggle, 1G. And Wiggle is where you can upload data. You can get a, you can add it to your phone, you can add it to another device. It lets you read all the signals around you and create a map of the area. So there's a wiggle, there's like five or six wiggle locations inside of UT. There's one inside this building somewhere, by the way. You can look it up on wiggle.net. That's somebody with a phone or a device that's capturing all the internet activity inside this building and out across your campus. That gets uploaded. And we have geographic points where different things pop up by name and kind of by how they communicate. And so that crowdsource resource is one of the things we utilize to correlate locations. And it's a little and then we look at traffic patterns, how people buy things, how criminals actually deploy these devices and all that stuff to create a map. And that's something that we talk to states about more than anything else. It's not really something that you talk to a company smaller or an entity smaller than that. And that's one way that we've used intelligence work to kind of innovate in the field. Any questions? Anybody ever had a credit card stolen? Yeah, you've been around long enough. <laughs> yeah. Nobody else? That's awesome. I hope it never happens. But it will, unfortunately. Statistically, it's gonna happen. So I think, uh, based on our last statistics, in Austin, there are a couple of thousand of these deployed. On average, we see three to four at a gas station at a time. Yeah, these are just gas stations. All right, uh, election security. Also something we work on with intelligence. So. The technical side will go in, we'll fix networks, we'll try to organize things, we'll help them with policy, make sure things are in the best order possible so that the election is secure. And we do this with the state of Texas and we do this with other states, though they've asked us not to name them openly. But we do work with multiple states. Can I say not Iowa? <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I say that? a little bit too much information. Okay, sorry. You've already said it. No, I didn't say this and I'm not gonna talk about Iowa. We don't work with that. <laughs> 
Everybody's heard about that debacle, right? Yes. What do you think happened? Come on. It's an untested app. Untested app. But she's got <laughs> But what happened? Why did it fall apart? Besides the fact that they didn't test it. They didn't train anybody to use it either. Didn't train anybody to use it. Man, they're just batting two for nothing. <laughs> Anything else? General? They didn't have a backup system in place in case it failed. No backup system, no failover, right? Something breaks, they have no way to, to fall back to anything. You serve the camera? Didn't it work like an EDOS? If they did DOS themselves, yes, sir. And it was a dynamic DNS. So all the polling stations reported in, and it overloaded the system. Untested, untrained, no backup. I heard that the phone line backup was also posted on an internet site for other parties to call in and make it more difficult as well. Again, untested, unsecured, before they put together. It's a great idea, bad implementation. Had they taken someone from cybersecurity or intelligence and used them as an advisor, there's specific fields that that's all they do. They tell software coders or developers or implementers of that particular technology on how to do so secure. You got a question, sir? No, I was just going to mention that it, it probably is way more common than people even think. Just you buy something based on, oh, I got sold on the security of it or all this, but you don't test it, you don't try it out, and then when it crashes, you're just like, oh, crud, what do we do? That's most startups. They, they kind of get things from them. You have to bring money in or you have money. If you don't have money, you're going to sell whatever you can until you get enough funding to start securing it, hopefully. But typically, no, especially if you have investors. It becomes a different side. That's a whole different topic, but interesting. So, but we do help. We talk. We work with states, kind of getting off highway. Uh, we help them identify problems, help them understand what's there, how to remediate it, and generally how to make it better, and how to make it more secure. So I always like to ask this question. Again, I told you two already, so you can't answer it. How many components to our election system? In the state of Texas, let's just talk locally. First, everybody, somebody voted? Helps if you voted, mm -hmm. but not yet? No, think about it. Make, it, make a good choice as far as making an enlightened choice of whether to do or not to do. Outside of that, whatever. Uh, but think about it. How many components to our election system? Just take a swing. There's got to be a there's got to be a voting machine, right? That's got to be one component. What is everybody crying about? Oh, they counted all the results and they got it wrong or they didn't get it out early enough, right? That's a separate component, the tally and tabulation. That's two parts of the system. They're completely disconnected from one another, except for one point when they touch. But there's other parts, right? You have to register to vote. There's a third component, right? And there's components behind that that come together to verify, validate, and quality check all the information. You have to have a poll station. You have to have a place to go to vote to put those machines in. All those parts come together. We have a very decentralized system of voting in the United States. That's awesome and also horrible. It's horrible from the sense of it's very bureaucratic. It takes a long time to tally everything because you're taking in data from all over the place, right? But it's awesome because it's very difficult to take down. What about the human element? Absolutely. That, so, uh, like human, possibly human error in tally? Sure. There's so many checks. Like, let's talk Texas. When you go in and vote, you vote at the voting machine. There's at least three quality checks run on the machine itself to make sure your answer is correct, right? What you put in there matches what they're about to report. There's a printout that you should get as well that has your data. Yeah. At that point, that gets transmitted to a central area inside that polling station. And it's accumulated. When it accumulates to a certain point, there's a person who's in charge of the polling station who comes and verifies that everything there matches everything that came out of the machine. And then the two major parties that are in there, for us it's a Democratic and Republican, they come in there and they both have to agree that that number's correct before it even leaves the polling station. So I'm how many? They both have to agree that the counts are correct from the original data. Yeah. And at that point, it gets a third quality check before it gets reported back. And then the next batch goes out. And that's just at the polling station. And it continues forward. Everyone has multiple checks. Each one's at least three layers deep. And it comments at human error. They also don't transmit singly. They transmit over multiple bands so that if somebody intercepted or contaminated traffic information in transit, it has to match up across all of them or it has to be retransmitted. If they can't get a fidelity, if they can't get a high enough fidelity on the data, it gets dropped. And everybody's asked to come back and reload. So I mean, human error, absolutely. Enormous amount of bureaucracy to combat. It's one of those few times where 
the procedures in place, especially for Texas, are very, very durable. Does that mean things don't happen? Absolutely. But they don't carry all the way to tally and tabulation, which is the most critical component. Because that's where everything is counted, aggregated, and reported. The only reason we get early reporting is because the states demand it from the counties. But we're very individual in Texas. So every county is actually in control of how it's going to handle its voting. And so many of them are very different from each other. Not all of them use the centralized voting registration system, for example. They want to do it manually. And so they do it manually. All those things add complexity. Now that, again, kind of crappy, but the awesome part is that system is hard to take down. Because if I break a voting machine, the results don't match up. It doesn't leave the polling station. Even if it gets past the polling station, it doesn't make it past the next check. If I compromise voter registration, they have multiple versions of voter registration, and the, the most, uh, the highest fidelity version of it is the one that's kept. And there's a separate version of it on each voting machine. And voter registration just authorize, authorizes voting. That's where I'm going. So that, that kind of redundancy and that kind of built-in breakdown, having it all decentralized, makes it very durable against attack. But it also makes it slow and occasionally prone to problems. When you add in things like an app that don't function properly, you can take down a whole state if you're not careful. But that's that's a policy level problem. Where they should have. I'm oh, sorry, Mr. President. Uh, from, from your end, obviously looking at it from the elector, uh, election security uh, perspective, has the introduction of so much technology in the actual running and apparatus of elections introduced? greater vulnerability than the more manual side that we used to go off of? Uh, or, or are there outside benefits, uh, you know, election security benefits that, than, than before, from your perspective? From my perspective, the benefits outweigh the problems that we brought in. There's, there was a lot of, there's a lot of benefits to doing it manually, to doing it in person. But we did do some things that helped make sure that data was quality that we can now do with uh, the right computer voting device. So the QAQC is uh, on the, now that we've instituted uh, technical means of voting, that's, that, that's been a net benefit. And speed to, there's been a huge speed benefit across the board. So it's one thing to vote, but if it takes six months for you to get your answer, it's too long. If it takes months to get your answer, it's too long. Especially when the campaigns are moving so quickly. Right? We haven't really changed their timelines, but they're only going to be in a state for a short period of time. They need to get the answer within hours, usually, is how this works now. But before, it would be weeks, if not months. We compress that down to where, by the time the last polling stations report in, usually results get out within hours. And that's, that's huge. That lets you make changes to strategies and stuff if you're a politician that's up for vote that you couldn't do before. That's a benefit for them. For us, we make sure that our vote gets counted properly is done correctly. You don't have to drop votes, missing votes, bad registrations, things of that nature. I'd say probably the key place if I had to put a finger on it would be the voting registrations. Just who's authorized to vote and are the right people voting for the area. Technology has enhanced that tremendously. Most people don't realize, I think it's GCIS, but there's a, a geospatial, I can't remember the, the federal entity, they have to put a put person in each place to verify that if you live in that county, they have to make sure your address actually exists. And it's on the county rules. It's things like that that we didn't do before that are enhancements. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'll be down on this, but there's a lot to election security. Let me talk about the intelligence part really quick, but it's not really on here. Is it on the next slide? Um, so this is the disinformation. I was going to talk about disinformation. Yes. Okay. So that's the technical side. The disinformation piece is the spillage of and actual operations by individuals to change the dialogue in a way that's not appropriate. There's a lot of ways to change dialogue, to steer a dialogue the way you should, open debate, proper discussion. But when someone comes in with malicious intent and steers that information down a road that is counter to what is norm, that's where disinformation starts. And, you know, I hate to say it, but we do this to other countries, they do it to us. And it's, there's a, it's very difficult to kind of separate out what's a legitimate disinformation campaign and when, what's just someone speaking as is their right. And we have rules and guidelines for that to make it very clear. So uh, 
we fairly specialize in that. So uh, you don't see it here in Texas that often, but if you, I can't name counties right now. Um, not here, but not too far from us. How about that? Can I do that? <laughs> I'll get in trouble. So we have seen it here where someone is steering the dialogue in a uh, nefarious fashion to damage a candidate, and it's not done through legal means. And we trace that by following the money, like in most law enforcement cases, and tracing how uh, the conversation started. Questions? Can you touch a little on the URL hijacking? Yeah. Um, if you like. So um, lookalikes and Typo squatting and things like that where, you know, like, can you name what your county website is off the top of your head? It, you probably search for it, right? You're like, what's my, what's our county? What county do you live in? Travis, Travis County, right? What's the Travis County website URL address? No idea, right? You'd probably go Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever. Travis County website, right? It would pop up and you'd probably select in the first page. Would that be fair to say? Mm -hmm. Now, if I wanted to poison search results, so that I bubbled up a poisonous link into that first page. I could do so. It would last probably 12 to 24 hours, depending on what search engine you're using, but you can do you can do those kind of activity. I could steer you to a site that looks a lot like Travis County website that you're expecting, but then I would just collect data on you. Because you're going there with the thought process to give information up, I could ask you for personal information you probably ordinarily wouldn't give me. Last word, your social, your name, where you live, address, if you're paying for something, I could probably get your, your payment card information really easily because you expect that question. And you may leave not knowing the wise man. That's an example of both poisoned SEO and URL hijack. You can also hijack a URL directly through a technical means, just take it over. This happens all the time to several news agencies where their, um, their stuff gets hijacked. They're really good, they shut it down within 30 minutes. Yes, well, uh, I'll start with him and you. Would you say that that problem is very similar to the problem of like people creating fake businesses on the internet and having those like jump up on search results? There's a relationship, yes. Okay. They're probably cousins. So there's a whole business behind creating uh, legitimate looking entities and selling them in those dark nets we talked about in those criminal communities. And the older those companies are, the better. So you might create a company today that won't get used for another decade because then there'll be 10 years of activity. That tends to throw off most people's searches. I'm interested more in the legal and illegal disinformation mm -hmm. campaigns that you guys are seeing. Um, you said that a lot of times they're leading back to a money trail that has some illegal issues with it. Um, you know, Facebook has come out publicly and said, we're not gonna police political ads. Right. Um, there's lots of legal ways to do this. Mm -hmm. Like, why do they do it illegally if there's lots of legal ways? And are there policy options that you see being feasible to limit those legal ways of changing the conversation? Mm -hmm. Policy? I can't speak well on policy, so That's fair. Um, I can talk about the technical aspect of it. Policy-wise, it would be very difficult, and we'll say this. So, how do you, have you ever donated to a candidate before? Uh, if you can walk through it in your head with me, a lot of times when you when a candidate asks for money, they'll have a website with their name, and they'll openly ask for donations to their campaign. Now, if I've hijacked that or created something that looks like it, and you go there, it's a mimic of their site, legitimate site, and you donate money, I'm collecting money. And you may think you've given to that political candidate, but you've actually given to me come and want to. I appreciate the donation. But I'm not, that won't help you. That's one example. Another example would be I take over, I get the secret keys that are behind that account. Mm -hmm. So when they accumulate the first million, I'm just going to take that. And you've also donated to Criminal Monte again, though you even though you went through a legitimate route. And we have laws that govern that that's all illegal activity already. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can really change that. It's the discovery of it that's interesting. And, that, and that's just one method. Uh, pol uh, politicians tend to ask for donations in five to ten different ways. And they're pretty standard. But not always. Sometimes there's some unorthodox ways. I've seen everything from Kickstarters to Indiegogo campaigns before around some kind of political movement. Um, there was one about build the wall for about two or three years ago. Yeah. Right? That money went to an individual. 
and it was nowhere legitimately atta attached to any kind of activity that would facilitate building the wall. In fact, if you follow that money trail, it has not gone anywhere except that person's pocket. Those are the kind of activity that we would see. That's the financial piece. Right. This information-wise, uh, I said before, U.S. does it to other agencies, and you know, they do it to us. You know, that may, that's an operation where I'm coming in with an intent. I have a playbook that I'm going to follow. I have a candidate that I either want to bump up or have candidates that I want to press down. Or I may just want to cause enough chaos that there's no easy candidate. It depends on what my intent is. Mm -hmm. A lot of times the intent is to push a candidate up or down. And so I can't name names, but in Texas this happens. It's happening right now, <laughs> actually, on certain individuals. Right now it's a heavy election time, right? And I'm not talking about the presidential piece, so let me just separate all that. I'm not talking about that at all. A lot of times this is focused on local. Mm -hmm. Because you can make impacts. And that's usually two, three, or four steps out. They want a certain policy passed. Maybe they want to change, I don't know, how wastewater is managed in a particular county. To do that, they have to put the right person in place. And to get that to happen, they have to do activity to lead up to make that person the most likely candidate and then make sure they get swayed properly. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see several campaigns operate around that. So if I want to make that a hot topic issue, I have to create the dialogue. And I have to build that dialogue. I may create 10, 15, 20 different channels to talk about that, to get that in front of everybody, to make it a hot topic. And at that point, I can get it injected into the political dialogue and then push to get that right person in place. That's kind of a long standing off that would take months. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, but all that's legal. That, that aspect of it. It's legal unless you're an outside entity. Yeah. Now you're a foreign entity interfering with local politics. That's totally illegal. Sure. Okay. And figuring that out is the key. And so for us, following the money, understanding how the dialogue started is critical. And there's some legal aspects to that. If I if I live in another country and I represent another country and I hire you to take that activity, does that make you culpable? Is a question that I don't know is very clear. Because now you're a third party. You're the cat's ball for what I want to happen. Mm -hmm. That's something that would be in the legal realm, but I don't know an answer for. But mm -hmm. you know, how far out do you have to be? If I'm directly engaging you to do an activity, you're actually operating on behalf of me. So anyway, sorry, we can go down that side quite a bit, but I can talk to you after this if you'd like to ask more questions. Well, we kind of got into some of the recent examples already. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll go real quick through these. Um, WannaCry, have you heard about this campaign? Have you heard about WannaCry malware? I saw a few people nod. WannaCry, you may know what it means. Change the world. Really did. I mean, we kind of throw that out, but WannaCry changed the dialogue across all companies internationally because across the world, that particular piece of malware hit everybody. Mm -hmm. Hit everybody. If you owned, if you were operating a Windows system, especially in a server capacity, you got hit with WannaCry more likely than not. So all the big companies got slapped hard. Do you know why WannaCry succeeded so well? Two big reasons. People couldn't update the machine. That's number one. And they didn't update, even though there was a valid patch out, and it had been out for months. So that's number one. Number two, it was one of the first pieces of malware to really capitalize on, um, well, so, yes and no. What, what's the term <laughs> blue exploit? The uh, hack and exploit. We'll get to that, I'm gonna ask you about that in a second. But it, it actually exploited SMB, right? Yes. SMB is how, um, machines can network with one another to have shares and things like that. It's very common inside of corporate environments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it utilized several exploits that allowed it to openly spread. And every time it infected someone else, it, that also spread. And it, it hit everybody across the world. And the reason I said it was world changing is because it made everybody kind of wake up and go, crap, we need to pay attention to security. It was probably the biggest event that made large corporations and small go, we really got to pay attention to this because it took many of them to their knees. They lost a lot of money because they got shut down. Now, you mentioned Eternal Blue. And you said NSA exploit, NSA leaked exploit, right? Who called it that? I'm going to make a point here. At your expense, I apologize. But yeah. The newspaper. But actually, where did the newspapers get it? from the criminals. 
criminal said, we stole this from NSA, and they released it into an open repository. The news media picked it up and ran with it. Yeah. Should we always believe criminals? No. <laughs> right? So the only, only people who have said that that's a leaked NSA exploit is the criminals who mm -hmm. wanted to advertise it. So keep that in mind. Criminals play games too, and they have their own marketing campaigns. So this was is, it? What's that? So was it a leaked NSA exploit? It's a good question. <laughs> NSA is probably not telling. That's the only one who can really tell us for sure. They've released a couple of things, that particular the shop brokers. They've released a couple of things mm -hmm. occasionally and they have, they have said this belongs to X agency, NSA being the most common one. Was it true or not? Hard to say. Do they work? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So it I just I will tell you just as a generalism, you can't believe criminals when they're trying to provide attribution to something. When they're trying to say this is the provenance of something, they're not trustworthy. Okay, so that's one correct. Not Petya. You've heard of that one, of course. Nietzsche, so not Petya. Uh, also interesting. Does anybody know why? You said you. And then you got it. It's like one correct. So from its name, why do you think? Well, here, you help me out. Why do we call it not Petya? So Petra was a piece of ransomware. They got cracked by a, uh, a female uh, Polish reverse engineer who's badass, by the way. <laughs> Shares Audi as her Twitter handle. I don't, I mean, I don't have any relationship with her. She's really nice and she's a phenomenal coder. Uh, she cracked um, Mishka and Petra, the two ransomwares written by one coder. Who was like, nobody could crack my stuff. She cracked it within 24 hours. <laughs> Kicked his tail, but he's not a business. <laughs> He gave up the game. So when Petya came back, everybody's like, why is Petya back? Somebody bought the code base. They traced it back to a forum where it had been purchased because he put it up for sale, $35,000. Sold his code base. And then within a few months, we saw Petya go everywhere. Started in Ukraine and kind of spread out. First 24 hours, everybody across the world in my industry said, oh, it's Petya, no worries. It wasn't. It was not Petya. And it actually was a destructive piece of ransomware. And that until 24 hours elapsed, nobody realized what was going on. And it gave it a chance to do an immense amount of damage. Now there's a lot of reasons how it did so. One of which is it was spread through a server in Ukraine against everybody who did work and business back up. If you do business in Ukraine, you had to use their accounting agency, period. They made no exceptions. You want to do business with us? Great, you have to use our accounting agency. That particular operation compromised their server that downloaded patches to their accounting software. And during some of those patching, they added in, not patching, and downloaded it to everybody that did business with the state of Ukraine. So when they executed it, and they burned that particular point, when I say burned it, they gave it up, they executed the malware from there, letting everybody know that that's what they had compromised. They did it after they had collected all the information they wanted. And then they took all those people down in small and large ways. And it was known for a bunch of other things. It had a hard coded switch in it and stuff like that. That's kind of not part of our conversation, but it's a fun thing to talk about. But it was important because it also utilized some of those leaked exploits, among other things. And it, it was a very good operation in that it was able to compromise an enormous amount of people in a very particular way. And also, it disguised itself from the whole community across the world for 24 hours. First time that it happened by letting you see what you should. They were like, you expect Petya. So they let you look at Petya. And you didn't realize it wasn't Petya until the reports started coming in and everyone realized that you got clean the windows. <laughs> uh, that it was destructive in nature. Very, very damaging. Okay, we already talked about Iowa, so I'll skip Iowa. Um, something a little closer. Were you involved in the Texas Transfer event? 22 counties? 23, actually. No? Okay. I can't talk about that too much. Should get on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that was an example where um, a third party got compromised and it allowed multiple counties to be damaged with ransomware potential. Now, Texas responded very well. If you don't know, Texas as a state has an enormous capacity to respond. UT was involved in that. You guys were openly involved with that. As well as the National Guard and, of course, 
um, Texas DIR, I think is the right thing to do. And so that got policed up really well. But it is a example of where a third party can allow the entrance of damaging software, damaging events into your environment. And that's where a SOC really shots. In the Security Operations Center, they would watch those third parties so that you could keep an eye on them and keep them from doing damage or at least read when things are going wrong. Yes? Um, related but tangential. Um, sure. How does your company handle just the massive indicators from you know the different alerts that come through as far as security compromise? Do you use a software program to help weed through that? Do you use, we, we heard um, not too long ago that like there's some game theory approaches to how you do that. How, how do you guys tackle that problem? Sure. Um, we use custom in-house software that we've written and we, we tinker with all the time. Uh, it breaks everything into tiers and we have low quality indicators in the lowest tier and they rarely um, elevate themselves out of it. There's a promotion system involved in there on how much fidelity and understanding we have around each indicator. We do a lot of grouping and clustering to, uh, to get them promoted. So depending on what we know and how much context we can put around an uh, indicator or a group of indicators, it'll promote up into our second tier and then our third tier. We don't really take action on anything until it gets into that final tier. Mm -hmm. And so we bring in information that we know is going on in the criminal environments and in the criminal marketplaces, and we attach it to indicators that are like DNS indicators or file hashes or just news activity, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So if we have a client, give me out of trouble here. We have a customer who has an event that we're responding to. We're gonna immediately enrich it. We'll, all those indicators go into our low tier system and I'll begin promoting them up if I can enrich them enough to make sure that they they should be acted on. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard to explain without getting in too much into the weeds, but um, if I see it, I'll do general. If I see a lot of activity on the perimeter of a network where someone is obviously just going through a whole net range, so everybody knows that you have an IP address, right, for your machine when you get on the internet. Every computer that gets on the internet has an IP, right? A lot of times that IP is your router. So your router has one IP, it may give 10 IPs to people that are connected to it. All of you are actually coming out as if you're this router. Does that make sense? Hopefully you have two IPs on every machine. Like her computer right there has two IP addresses, guaranteed. Her local one, the one that she thinks it is, and the one that actually it is to the rest of the internet. And you can see both of them, your browser tells them just announces it whenever you go to a website. Everybody follow? Okay, so low quality indicators, let me get a cluster of those that represent somebody's script that's trying to access a server that I have on one IP address. And if I see it go to the adjacent IP address and that adjacent IP address, that's typical activity I expect, it's low level common activity where it's trying to probe for something. That's a low quality indicator. It may never promote out of that low quality tier unless I know that in addition to that, I'm getting a script echo that I can fingerprint. Mm -hmm. I can see what they're looking for. They're in particular trying to access certain points on those servers that represent a vulnerability. Now I can go and see if that's being sold as a service in a criminal marketplace and go, okay, that's an enrichment item that might promote it up to tier two to pay more attention to. And it will continue to go through that process. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah, it's actually a really complex system to try to boil down into a few things. Uh, and of course, every SOC has a um, security incident and event manager, an SIEM. So a SIM or SIEM, depending on who you are and how you want to pronounce it. SIEM, everybody has one of those. And it takes all the events from your computers, as well as events and, and alerts from all the security devices, and puts it in one window. And you can clean that up and only look at certain things that you need. Okay. Any other questions? You can keep asking questions. I like this. Go ahead. So it seems um, a lot of, and I don't want to confuse, like you made a clear distinction between threat researchers and uh, kind of your more intelligence model. Is that your value proposition to your customers that you guys operate more as an intelligence organization? Because there's a lot of threat researchers out there. There's a lot of cybersecurity firms out there that offer services. Is that really the crux of like what you're offering your customers to differentiate yourselves? Absolutely. And we give them a taste of it almost every engagement. And it makes a difference. Because a lot of times I'm like, they're attacking you. They're after your profile in the company. And I can explain why. It tends to be a game changer for them. Especially if you're an executive or you're someone in a position like, hey, you're the um, chief financial officer. You expect to be targeted to a certain amount, but 
you indicate and you show them all the evidence you need to to show that, okay, the criminals know who you are and are actually targeting your profile and everybody that assists you. So they're striking both at you and loudly around you. That's kind of what we would present versus saying, hey, you got fishing. Right? There's a, there's a level of difference here. And a lot of times we can actually pull out the data that anybody in the SOC needs to identify when that fishing is going to happen. The beauty of being in the marketplace and seeing it being planned is we see them going, hey, we're going to go use his service. So I'll go to his service ahead of time and get a sample of what it would look like so I can understand what it's going to be. And then you, the client, I'm like, hey, they're going to attack you in the next three weeks because that's what they've said. Here's what it's likely going to look like. Mm -hmm. And when you detect that, you know that you can trust our process. Mm -hmm. And we have a very high accuracy rate. Isn't that kind of how the OPM hack was, was caught? It was actually during the course of essentially a, a, a network defense pitch. And, and they, were, they were like, ah, well, yeah, we know you can't afford this high level system, but let's take it out for a test drive just so you can see what the capabilities are. And they started to see, oh crap, you have all well, this data that's being expelled out of your. Yeah, that's how they found it. Because they have no idea. No idea. So, go ahead. No, no I don't you mind. can finish. No, that's fine. He just made a point. That is indeed how OPM, Office of Personal Management, got compromised. They had no idea they were leaking data until someone put in a proof of concept for a piece of software, software hardware company, I think. And they caught that they were exfiltrating, they was leaving their network without their knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's horrible. I mean, catastrophic and horrible. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, there's a lot of threat indicator um, repositories publicly available now. Yeah. Um, do you guys share with those threat indicator? We don't generate the same kind of indicators. Like I don't generate uh, DNS file or um, registry entries. I don't, do, I don't deal in those kind of things. So it's very hard to create those kind of feeds or to, comment or to contribute. What I do contribute is your rules, which are heuristic logic to detect things like that in both in any capacity. So it can detect any kind of file in any state. So if it's in transit on a network, in partial or in full, or it's sitting resident on a file statically, or it's active in memory, your can detect any of those states and find things. It can also find things inside of files. So we deploy a lot of those. Uh, we also deploy signal rules, which are made for those SIMs, SIEMs, and that's server lo that's logic for a SIM to be able to make it on worker detection. And those we do contribute to. Um, but the other things, no. We, so find, that, we find them of no value, to be honest. Hmm. Yeah. But that, that sharing, um, so you're actually uploading those sorts of tools to some sort of publicly available system, we or? We have, well, first it goes to all our customers, absolutely. Right. And then we have a couple of uh, venues that we share it in. So one of those is, I'm going to throw an acronym at you, but uh, NCFTA. So that's the National Cyber Forensics Training Alliance. We're a partner with them. We're also a part of their training arm. And they allow us to have a direct pipeline into all the regional and, and national agencies in the US. Mm -hmm. So banks and so on that have a great need for this data, this pipeline's right to you. Mm -hmm. But as far as like an open public repository, we have a few things on GitHub that we share. But that's not where we move most of our data. So part of the conversation is you have to understand what we're providing, and mm -hmm. that's where we found we get the deer in the headlights look a sure. lot of times. You have to have the capability to use it. Yeah. Good question. Um, we do believe in sharing. That is a part of all the ISACs, if you're familiar with that mm -hmm. term. There, there's ISACs for every major category of business, every market vertical you can think of, from healthcare on down to banking to even education. And elections, yeah. <laughs> and ISACs are big on share, but they're they're in the threat model approach of they don't really understand things beyond those basic indicators. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's kind of a long discussion on why, but I can I can summarize it simply: your security devices can only intake so much of that data. It's actually highly perishable, which means it dies mm -hmm. out very quickly. If I pipeline you until you hit your limit, and that data is old or it doesn't, isn't relevant anymore, or it's not focused on you, you now have cluttered up your alert system with a lot of data that may be alerting that you can't do anything with. And you create alert fatigue for your security analysts. And so we don't play in that game at all. What we do is provide things that your security analysts can use immediately, and it's with a signal rule they can put inside their SIM and actually employ automatically. And if they get detections, use the R rules to look inside of either network traffic or on file systems to make a detection. 
and that, that's a much better system that's more flexible and that will last longer. Mm -hmm. Election security, we've talked about a lot of this, but I'm, I'm gonna move through this. Yeah. Good news is attackers' yeah. motivations and then both vulnerabilities at the end, but we can, we can pause at any point. So this tries to make a point that I had said earlier. You know, what does a criminal look like? What's a hacker look like? Hacker's a terrible term because it's not very accurate, mm -hmm. right? We kind of glorify that term, but it kind of depends on what side of the fence you're on. Some people straddle the fence, which is not a good place to be. But the point here is that it could be anybody. It could be somebody in this room, somebody down the hall, somebody in another country. Yeah, they could be 10, they could be 50. They could be 100. I don't know any 100 year olds but that could do that, but it's possible. And a lot of times, this is what, I'm going to skip that one because we talked a lot about it. This is the one that really throws people off. This is. I told you earlier, intelligence often answers the why. I haven't been, I've, I've responded many times. I think we do an average of 40 or 50 incidents a year. And every time I respond, I think I'm on, I'm on one right now. Um, and it's February, it's gonna be a busy year. Every time, the boss, the executive, the president, whoever who's in charge of it, always says, why? Why me, why us, why now, right? Sometimes the why is relevant, like they did it because you're about to push payroll out. Of course they attack you right before you push payroll out because they want to pretend to be you or they want to receive it. The why is straightforward. It's financially motivated. Mm -hmm. And financial motivation is 80% of all attacks. Mm -hmm. Flat out. And those stats change every year. There's Gartner and a couple other entities compile these stats and you can kind of play, you know, you can argue over whether it's 80 or it's 70 or it went to 65 or it dropped, you know, went up to 90. But at the end of the day, most motivations are financial. People are doing this because they need money. And this is what they do. And for them, the trade off makes sense. I steal a million dollar payroll. Take me a week to do that. That's doing all setup, infrastructure, the attack, and transferring it to my bank. I just got a million bucks for a week's worth of work. For them, the moral issue of why you shouldn't do that doesn't matter. And therefore, they were like, okay, that's good. For us, we're not going to do that. For them, it doesn't matter. So the why is straightforward. You know, inflicting harm. That's part of it, especially when it comes to elections, which is what this is supposed to talk about. But anyway, when it comes to elections, so if it's not in the financial bucket, there's always a reason. If it's an outside entity, they often have an they have an operational objective in mind. If they're military or government based in another country or our own, then their disruption activity will follow a playbook of some kind. It'll have objectives that need to be met. should be familiar with the top one because it's happening a lot recently in the public dialogue. So motivations are straightforward, but financially you can, you can kind of bet on. It changes by topic, so obviously the elections less financial. There's not a lot of money to gain by attacking it, unless I'm being paid to do so. So if you hire me in those dark nets area, areas to uh, you know attack an election for accounting, you're going to pay me substantial amount of money, or else I won't do it. But that would be the financial incentive. Mm -hmm. From our perspective, with that attack, in, when we're receiving that attack, it may not be apparent that there was a financial incentive behind it because our actions will defy mm -hmm. that. That's why you have to look at the people and why they're doing it. Knowing that I'm a gun for hire that will do that would make that connection happen. That's where you have to get past normal threat data to be able to understand that part of the marketplace. Now, there are a few companies besides us who do this really well, but they're not called fire right? Or but I'd say flashpoint's pretty good. And so I would watch it. I'd go for that for sure. Yeah, they're really good. I like that. <laughs> okay. Eight common attacks. These are the eight common attacks. They're not any specific one. Just to be clear. I mean, all these happen. So consider them equal. There's more than this, but these are kind of eight of the common ones. And Terry made them look awesome on the slide. So malware is easy, right? Malicious software. Tell you what will not happen. Phishing, we see it all the time. Anybody had malware before I jump off malware? <laughs> Makes sense. Oh, yeah. You've been in business long enough. You've had malware. Malware gets on your machine. Uh, if you take um, the CEH cert, there's malware in those files when you download. Keep that in mind. We have a couple of students who just downloaded those and didn't pay attention and they executed malware on their laptop. So. 
Everybody know what I'm talking about? CH, Certified Ethical Hacker. Mm -hmm. Is it CompTIA, I think, mean, sir? Yeah. Yeah. CompTIA? Yeah. Yeah. CompTIA. Yeah, they give you live knowledge. When I do it, I tell you. <laughs> the file name says, this is live. Don't execute this on Windows machine. All right, eavesdropping. We do side eavesdropping in part of our intelligence program. That's where I said you're a neutral party, or you pretend to be someone in the market. So uh, when I say marketplace, I want you to visualize Amazon for a moment. There are some places that look like that. You can search for a product, you can search for a service, and you can buy it and they deliver. Some of them don't look like that. They look like uh, an old 1990s forum. Some of them are just a web page with basic dialogue and a way for you to talk to them. Majority of those are none of those things, and they exist on Telegram. Anybody use Telegram? App on your phone, app on your laptop. It allows you to create an encrypted conversation between one or more entities. The nice thing about Telegram is you can make it perishable, which means it'll die off as soon as you leave as the administrator, and you can also go delete on everybody else's machine. Mm. Very convenient for a criminal, right? I'm gonna have a conversation with you two. When I leave, it's gonna delete our channel, and just in case you saved anything, delete. Now you have to take snapshots to, ret to retain that data, or otherwise separate it off. The other trick is don't synchronize back again and create a new Telegram account. All those will work. But Telegram and many other things like it, Signal, you can use Signal. Anybody use an encrypted chat tool? What's that? Signal, Telegram. You, you send SMS text messages, you text people. WhatsApp is end to end encrypted, right? I mean, it's I know it's had be. some <laughs> issues, but. Yeah, it, it, it's bad, just flat out. It's fun for other things, but as far as an encrypted chat tool, it's been compromised too many times. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's better than using SMS. So if you just text normally, you're sending plain text to a cell phone tower. Anybody that's in between or talks to that cell phone tower will retrieve their message. If you don't know that cell phone towers are promiscuous, they'll talk to anybody. They will. They'll give information up. So this is why if you don't use an encrypted chat tool, you should. Signal is cost you nothing. It's, it's better. It hasn't been compromised. Telegram also costs nothing. There's a paid version as well. And you can create channels and have conversations. So are you saying that the crypto in WhatsApp has been compromised? or just There's like exploits that? in WhatsApp that allows you to get access to the data. Which they've closed, haven't they? Or? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> there's the public announcements that companies make, and then there's the reality. Mm -hmm. they, it's always a matter of them keeping their brand and identity tight, so they'll release a patch, and even if it only addresses a percentage of the problem. Mm -hmm. So if I take the most public problem and solve it, I can then spend time on the things that are less in front of, in front of the public eye and I can kind of stretch things out. So I don't want to say bad things about WhatsApp, but yeah, they have problems. They're very popular, and that just means they become a party. Anything's better than SMS, though. SMS is just plain text, and you're giving away anything. Everything you talk about. Because your phone will talk to any nearby cell tower, whether it's legitimate or not. So if I put a pineapple in this room and make it look like a cell tower, all your phones will connect to it automatically. Android, iPhone, doesn't matter. Google phone, Windows phone, they all do the same thing. That's how Wiggle, for example, collects a lot of data. Man in the middle, turn, you're in between. So I'm talking to you, but he's in the middle, he's intercepting all our conversation. When you talk back, he intercepts your side. There's a lot of ways to do this. A lot of times in internet traffic, you, you, this happens in your browser. Uh, brute force, remember I was saying, a script is knocking on one server on an IP address goes to the next one, that's a brute force attack. It's just going in and trying a bunch of things. Now that can be done a lot of different ways. Iterating through servers is one, staying on one server and trying a bunch of different things is another. A lot of ways. A lot of times it's done with credentials. I don't know that you have remote desktop on until I try it. And if I get a response that you do have 338 open, okay, let's try some credentials. Let's try a couple things, see what works. SQL injection. I can sound. Everybody knows what SQL is? SQL? No? Just know, just know that it's a way to inject. Right? You can inject uh, logic into the query that goes and retrieves information to get it to either break or pull information it shouldn't or any of a number of possibilities. DDoS is what happened in Iowa. They, they, they did a distributed denial of service on themselves. And of course, WannaCry, very, very very, very easy example of 
why you don't have software causing problems. So if you look at your phone and you have a pending update and you haven't done it for three weeks, that's usually a bad idea, right? My wife does this a lot. Drives me crazy. But uh, yeah, in, uh, in large environments, a lot of times they'll patch come out and they won't patch for months. It seems counterintuitive, but they know they have to test that patch so it doesn't break things they haven't played. Now, where it's not life-threatening, you can kind of game that a little bit and make best compromise. But think about if you're a hospital for a second. I'm going to patch this heart monitor, but I don't know what that patch is going to do. It might actually render that entire machine inert. So I can't do that while it's connected to you. And if I have 100% uptime on all my machines, I can never patch that thing. So now you get into a situation where you can't patch that device legitimately. And so part of our job on security as a security engineer would be, how do you fix that? The answer is you microsegment around it. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> okay, you know what segmentation in a network is? That's right, networks all connect together. If you don't do anything, you have a big flat network. Everybody can see everybody else. If you're all connected to the same router that gives you internet activity, everybody can see everybody else. When you segment, you create a division. You put another router or a smart switch or something in there to break those two apart so not everybody can see everybody. When I want to micro segment, I take, I might, if I micro segment in this room, every laptop would be on its own segment. Every phone would be on a separate segment. Any device that can connect to any capacitor would all be on its separate segments. And I might even further subdivide to protect them. Try to move faster. How do I, how am I in time? Am I over? I have five minutes. I need to talk. Uh, air gapped. Okay, air gapped, you have a separate network that's not connected to the internet. That's typically how people look at that. Now, an air gap network has an air gap around it, you're not connected to the things. But the minute you take a device and plug it into your air gap network, you've created a bridge. And you're transferring whatever was, this was plugged into before to that network. Every time you do that, you, come, you have a chance to compromise or contaminate. That's frequently how they get around that. And also, if your gap is not big enough, uh, there's ways to use signals to cross that gap anyway. It just depends on what's on inside your air gap network. So if you have done nothing to harden it and secure it and it's still looking for a Bluetooth connection and all this other stuff, crossing the gap is easy because you're asking me to. If you close those down, then it becomes more device. Okay. Question? Attackers need only one entry point. So when I attack or when someone attacks a system, so I'm Criminal Monty, I break into your network, I generally don't land where I want to be. I have to figure out where I'm at. It takes a couple of commands. Anybody here have any history in using show commands? You do. I suspect there's a bunch with the spider. <laughs> you know, I'm sure you have as well. But with a couple of very simple commands, you can kind of figure out who you are on the network and where you're situated. Because if you talk, it'll tell you what the gateway is. Right? It'll give you the IP. Right? You can run IP configure, it's configured for the machine you're on. You can get a bunch of data. Right? I can run NVT and get NetBIOS data, right? I can run NetStat and get more data. I can query the gateway to have it tell me all the IPs that have been pulled out with just a couple commands. And what that tells me is, tells me all about the segment I'm on. And once I figure out who I am, and I can literally go, who am I, as a command, and it'll tell me what my computer name is. So, would you mind if I pick on you for a second mm. with the computer? Yeah. Sure. Your computer name, does it have your name in it? Good. Does it have your company name in it or the school or anything like that? Are I have no idea, honestly. They, so look at, they set it up. They set it for you? <laughs> yeah. So they have something they use. They being wherever you're provisioning. UT. Yeah. UT, okay. UTIT has a naming convention for laptops. And so if I, were, if I did a who am I on your laptop, it's going to give me that name. And it's going to tell me what your IP has been assigned and also policy data and a bunch of other things. And I can use that to figure out who you are on this network. And if you're not who I want to be, you know, I want to be on the server. I need to move laterally. Mm -hmm. So from you, I need to jump to someone that you have access to. So if you see, do you see any shares? You don't have to answer, but if you see shares or you're able to connect to other computers, that's how I would move. I don't even have to elevate permission. I don't even have to grab big, bigger permissions yet. Anything you have access to, I have access to. Because I'm on your machine pertaining to you. 
And that's how attackers start moving around. If they can elevate permission, which means they can get an administrator level permission, or worse, domain administrator permission, they can do anything. Freely. And this is how they move around. In fact, so it can take minutes for them to get in and move. Or it can take hours. It depends. Now, I might be really skilled at doing this, but I may take hours instead. Any idea why I would do that? Reduce your footprint. Reduce my footprint. Okay. Not be detected. To not be detected is number one. If I go slow, remember there's a security operations center watching alerts. Mm -hmm. If I do too many things too fast in succession, I set off alerts. But if I run net set and I stop, and I wait, and if I run a couple of the commands, it might trigger an alert. If you're watching command shell activity, alert fatigue. Well, yeah, I could generate a bunch of alerts, but I want to see if you're actually paying attention to it. If you don't take activity that I would expect, then I know that you're probably not watching command shell. I could just run a whole bunch of them. Because you're not watching. I could move on. Because most people don't, because it generates a lot of alerts. And it goes back to your point about alert fatigue. They turn that off unless there's a reason for it to be on. Plus, administrators are lazy. They put passwords in shell commands when they're updating things, and there's a resident there. So it can take minutes or hours. All right. I need to move on. I have probably two minutes left. Ransomware is the most common opportunistic attack. So there's two parts here, opportunistic or targeted. Targeted is probably pretty straightforward. I'm focused on you. I'm attacking you. What's opportunistic? Your car is unlocked, so I open the door and install all of your things in your Yes, car. that's opportunistic. Your car is unlocked, your window's open, so I came in and burgled your house, right? I mean, the opportunity was there, I took it. You can also say random. The random is not as nice as word. So opportunistic. You left the door open, I walked in. You left five grand on the table, I picked it up. Worse, you can't see me, you don't even know. So ransomware is opportunistic because they shotgun approach the attack. Boom, you're just gonna attack a big spectrum. Opportunity will be if you're vulnerable to it, you'll get attacked. You have a transfer payment, 84K, high number. Downtime, 16 days. That's for companies. That's a lot of time. I think the longest that I've seen a downtime for ransomware uh, was a very large company was down in three and a half months. Yeah. Uh, it was amazing that they stayed in business. Most businesses will go under at two years after a ransomware. Mm -hmm. I should put the beer example in here. You know that one? I did it in response to a company that made beer here locally. Um, before cyber defenses, though. Mm -hmm. And they lost the recipes for their beer. Oh, no. And it was, they couldn't remember them. <gasps> so they went out of business within a year. An example, they had it all hidden, they had a separate computer, and it was a pretty elaborate uh, setup, but his computer connected to that server that he had hidden, even away from his IT staff and everyone else, and when his laptop got compromised, it spread to that. No backups. That's so. what a safe deposit box is for. Yes, that would have been a better option, but they were hiding the recipes from everybody. That was not the best way to do it. So uh, this part up here, decoys, is very common to release ransomware as a cleanup event or to decoy. I attack you. So Samsung is a threat group you might have heard of, or Samus. They're, they're notorious for releasing the Samus ransomware as a cleanup. I come in, I steal all the data I want. I don't want you to detect traces. I release. My Samus ransomware, I brick all your computers. Your only option is to restore them. Therefore, deleting all, one minute, okay, deleting all the evidence. The other ones use it as an attack to, op, to take a, the time of your operation center and your security analysts so they can do an attack somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to have time to talk about elections, sorry. OK, we do a lot of election work. We've already covered a lot. We've covered a lot of it. So we help them do stuff. And that's terrible to say, but we go in, we actually do a full audit on their system, we understand it, we come in and then they either deploy, we even had our weekend refresh where we come in Friday and we refresh the whole network by Monday. We did that for a few counties, not here, but still relevant. And you know, we, could really compute, we come in and do a complete makeover if it's necessary and they'll support it. Where it's not, we give them the best that we can as far as Best ways to detect their network, or sorry, protect their network in the um, most optimum fashion for whatever their configuration is. So we individualize it heavily. And we give them an assessment of what it looks like. Carrie, I think, has samples that she could probably 
is provided if you're really interested. And it goes through and measures them against a national standard. We're using this framework, the CSF for our framework to measure them and score them so they can see how they progress in the back. Ha! <laughs> Ten seconds. Ha! Ah. Yep, yeah. Good job. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate you. you for coming out.